friends, well great to see so many of you on this freezing cold winter mid-March evening. Uh, it's great to be back here, I used to live just nearby, I was a member of Hackney Labour Party for two and a half years until I tragically defected to the Socialist Republic of Islington North. Oh, boo it, heck, <laughs> um, I think the title, as has been said, could be more apt, The Great Benefit Swindle. We've got to link that, of course, to the great economic swindle, because it's really part and parcel of the same thing. The fact that everything we warned about under this government has come to pass, not that we can take any joy from it, given the consequences for communities like this. The fact the debt is growing, the fact the underlying deficit is growing, the fact the IFS uh, predicts that we will borrow £64 billion more than the government predicted by 2015. The fact growth has been sucked out of the economy and it's predicted today that by 2015, um, um, we won't still necessarily have recovered the size of the economy we have and Lehman Brothers came crashing down. The longest economic crisis, not since the 80s, not since the 70s, it's even longer than the Great Depression. That is what austerity has done to this country. But what austerity is also doing, and this is the key point, is it's making working people, unemployed people, disabled people, pay for a crisis they have nothing to do with. We've been told ever since Lehman Brothers Dotton that we're all in this together. It's a statement that's veered from the ludicrous to the offensive ever since it was first said. Because it is a very serious economic crisis for the majority. And it's predicted by the Resolution Foundation that if you're a low earner, you're going to be 15% poorer by 2020 than you even are today. Save the children a few months ago, they interviewed thousands of parents and children across the country. They revealed the world that most journalists, politicians have absolutely no interest in. It's a world where parents have to choose between heating their homes and feeding their children. Where you've got mums and dads skipping hot meals to make sure their sons and daughters are fed. All coming at a time when we have uh, the size of school meals being cut because of budget cuts, breakfast floods being cut. This is the seventh richest country on earth. And apparently we can no longer afford to feed our poorest children. And at the same time what they're doing, uh, and as I say it remains boom time for the people at the top incidentally. The Sunday Times richly show that year on year the wealth of the top 1,000 people is booming. 2011 went up by a fifth. Uh, in 2010, it went up by 30%, the biggest jump ever recorded. Crisis for the majority, boom time for the people at the top. But austerity is also being an excuse for the Tories to dust off policies that they always wanted to do, but otherwise didn't think politically possible. Whether the privatisation of our NHS, whether the assault on education, the travelling and tuition fees, the dismantling of comprehensive education, the removal of what remaining rights working people have in this country. But the attack on the welfare state is part and parcel of that. It's not just a cost-cutting exercise. It is something rooted deeply in Tory ideology. But what we've seen since this coalition came to power is a cynical and tragically sometimes effective attempt to redirect people's entirely justifiable anger and the fact they're getting poorer year on year from the people at the top who cause this crisis, the people's neighbours down the street. They say to you, if you're in a low-paid job, uh, where, you're, where either you're not paid enough by your boss, you get a real terms pay cut year on year, where tax credits have been cut by the Tories, and they say to you this, hate the scrounger living next door, hiding behind their curtains. They say to you, if you're a low-paid private sector worker without a pension, because your boss has got rid of pensions in, your, in, in your, where you work. They say to you, Hate the nurse next door, he's still got an intact pension. They say to you, if you're making, uh, struggling to make ends meet, you should hate the, the immigrant down the road who supposedly has generous benefits they're not even entitled to. And the argument is always the same. You've been mugged and therefore your less deserving neighbour should be mugged as well. Now what they do as part of this is try and seek out the most extreme and unrepresentative examples. And I'll give you one example of this, because what they do is they find an example uh, as shameless a scrounger in quotes as they can find and pass it off as though it's the tip of the iceberg. The latest one is a woman 
called Heather Frost, who has 11 kids and apparently her daughter owns a horse, which will end up presumably in a burger at some point. Now, we can go into the details of this, we can go into the fact that uh, they had a dad in work who abandoned them, the daughter's in work and is paying for the horse herself, but that's not the point. The point is they're trying to, again, pass this off. And so that is what people who are unemployed are like. Now there are 1.35 million households in this country in which, in which at least one adult claims out of work benefits. Do you know how many of those are households with more than 10 kids? It's not half a million. It's not 200,000. It's not a thousand. It's 190. And I think by now each and every single one of them has had their own reality TV show. But they're passed off as though they are the tip of the iceberg. And the reality is they're brushed out of existence. The fact that it was reported uh, the other week, only slightly reported in, in the most minor way possible by a couple of outlets. But in Nottingham, Costa Coffee had opened up a shop. They'd offered eight near minimum wage jobs. Do you know how many people applied for those near minimum wage jobs? 1,701 people applied for poverty wage jobs in Costa Coffee. Give me another example the Jersey Roundtree Foundation. They did a study about young unemployed people. And they found that there were 66 young people looking for every single job in retail, in supermarkets and shops and so on. That is the real scale of desperation in this country which is airbrushed out of existence by our political and our media establishment. And all of that is to help justify the onslaught on the welfare state. Now there's one thing and one thing alone that I beg you to remember about this government in the next two years is this. So the debate which, unfortunately, Diane had to be subjected to and sit in the house and watch was a so-called welfare or rating bill. And what we have there is a bunch of overpaid Tories who laughed and jeered and bayed all the way through the debate as they went off to vote to reduce the incomes of the poor as a deliberate act of government policy for the first time since 1931. Now we know 60% of those affected are in work, and the rest, as I've just discussed, the people on the whole desperately looking for jobs that don't even exist. But again, it was an attempt to box labour into a corner, this idea that labour on the side of the skivers, whilst we're on the side of the strivers. And the tragedy is, those people who are having their tax credits cut, firstly, they've got their pay being cut in real terms, either in the public sector or the private sector, and then they get their tax credits on top of it. It's a double whammy affecting working people as well as unemployed people and others. We've got the bedroom tax has already been discussed, affecting up to 670,000 families who are going to lose up to £80 a month. Now, two thirds of those households have someone who are disabled in them. Today we had some concessions, and this is interesting, that they will no longer include army families who were going to be included if their sons or daughters being sent off to Afghanistan had vacated their room for more than 13 weeks and foster families. Now that's interesting because it shows that actually we can push them into retreat. There's been so much uproar about this one policy that we've forced them now on the defensive. And that should give us hope when fighting back against these other unjust policies. Because what they're saying with this is there is a real crisis of overcrowding in social housing. We've all got to accept that. But the reality is that is because we didn't build council housing in this country. And instead what they're doing is selling people going downsize. There's nowhere for these people to downsize to. There aren't any one bedroom properties. We even have the grotesque sight of couples often being given as their first home a two bedroom place because that's all there is on offer and then being hammered by this bedroom tax. At the same time, next month, which will be the cruelest month, because as well as all the bedroom tax, cuts the housing benefit, there'll be cuts to council tax benefit, cuts to disability benefits. It will be the biggest raiding of the British poor in modern times. And the real tragedy is this. A lot of those people don't even know what is about to hit them. Now we need, above all, a coherent alternative to this, because my fear is this, and I do a lot of meetings, and I always find anger, but often not a lot of hope. And without hope, people resign. People end up part of the biggest party in the country, which I'm afraid isn't the Labour Party, it's the ranting at the television set party. <coughs> but there isn't hope for people to fight back. So just quickly, this is what we need. 
Firstly, the whole idea of welfare spending being too high. Well, you know what? They've got a point. Not to do with a bunch of lazy scroungers dribbling on sofas in mansions made out of widescreen television sets because of a triple crisis. The housing crisis, the low wages crisis, and the jobs crisis. Now, people have absolutely every right to be furious about the £23 billion of taxpayers' money wasted on housing benefits. And that's not going in the pockets of the tenants. It's lining the pockets of wealthy landlords charging extortionate rent because we didn't go council housing and we didn't control rent. If we were going to council housing, we stimulate the economy, we create jobs, we bring down the, uh, the, the 5 million strong social housing waiting list and also the housing benefit bill too. The low wages crisis, tax credits are a lifeline for millions. But let's be clear, there are subsidies for low pay because businesses aren't paying their workers properly. If we had a living wage, we'd bring down the amount spent on tax credits, but also other benefits too, like housing benefit, because 93% of new claimants are people who are in work. And of course, the jobs crisis. Now, as Keaton said in the 30s, you look after the unemployment lines, then you sort the deficit or sort itself out. Let's talk about the fact we always hear about benefit fraud worth £1.2 billion a year whilst the people at the top are free to commit tax avoidance on a mass scale worth £25 billion every single year. No, actually, but anyway, £25 billion every single year, like Sir Philip Green, who's been appointed by this government as a, an advisor cutting out public services, who's registered his business under his wife's name in Monaco, so he doesn't have to pay any tax. Those are the things we need to be talking about. One of the other things that will be happening just quickly, my friend James Bennett, who works for Unite, will talk about this briefly, is a new joint union campaign set up by Unite and other unions to help combat the myths and the lies about the welfare state and also to give a voice to people who are being hammered. So my view is this, we offer a coherent alternative. We give a platform to people who are being hammered by the attack on the welfare state to take on these extreme demonised caricatures which have no basis in the reality of what people are going through. And by doing that we will give people hope and we will be able to take on this government and we will be able to defeat them as they attempt to make working people, the unemployed, disabled people and others pay for a crisis they have nothing to do with. And if the Labour Party is for anything, it is to fight for those people and that is what must happen.